Hello and welcome back into the workshop. We've got some more mouldings come in from a decorator on the outside of the property that we need to uh, supply some replacements for. So I thought I'd do a quick video on the uh, process of machining these up again. I've done one similar before, but uh, I, I always quite like machining these up and think it's quite interesting. So uh, here we go again. Now we've got three different profiles. One of sort of made before for him that he's slightly modified to create a pattern for a sill. Um, this is a profile for around the outside of the bay window. So it's a sash bay window and the front of the sash window finishes along this uh, unpainted part here. And then this is mitered around the outsides of the, of the bay to form a bit of a profile. And it's got a uh, rebate in the bottom here but uh, the render, it, that sort of sits over the render. So uh, we've got to recreate that. I think this piece is a, um, like the vertical section piece, because it's got the bevel on the back here. So that's going to be uh, around the corners of the bay. So where the two boxes meet, that's on the outside. And then this is obviously a sort of a subsill section that uh, has rotted away, I'm guessing it's from the same window and it will sit on that section there like that. So they're the three uh, profiles that we've got to um, sheen up. We've got quite a lot of this to make, so I've had to order some timber in, I haven't got enough to do it. Um, so we're just gonna start with uh, this piece um, initially. Now, this isn't a, uh, there isn't enough of this uh, required to warrant buying a specific cutter for. So especially on this piece, um, we only want two lengths at two, uh, four meters long. So we want eight meters in total. So if we go and buy a, uh, a cutter to cut this profile um, across here, looking at about probably 90 quids worth of cutters from Whitetail, um, it's just, just not worth, you know, the cost versus uh, what it's going to cost to replace it and, and get it near enough with other cutters. So I think I've got a selection of cutters that will, will get it near enough and uh, we'll get away with it. It's on a, on a first floor anyway, so uh, it's not going to be absolutely exact. And I think he's replacing everything that's there, so it's not even got to marry into another piece. So we'll get away with uh, just matching it with cutters we've got rather than uh, spending a load of money on a uh, specific cutter to cut this one mould in. But uh, like I say, I'm going to start with this piece because um, I've got this timber and uh, we can run them out uh, nice and quickly. I've not got a massive selection of cutters, unlike some joinery shops. Um, they've got thousands of cutters. Um, I've only got a few, and they're all sort of profile limiter blocks. I've not got any of the old style white hill cutters, um, which are clamped in the blocks. A bit dangerous, but I've never had a problem using them, as long as you're really careful with it. But uh, I've sort of reduced my uh, cutter selection to what I've got here. So. Let's try and find something that fits. I'm just going to grab a few off that I think might uh, might actually fit the profile we're looking for. It's got a nice, fairly deep curve on it. That's a decent size of though. This is that one. Okay, so that's about the biggest of low cutter that I've got. And that is not far off what we're looking for, to be honest certainly good enough for this job. So if you're holding a cutter up to a profile and you want it to be an exact um, idea of what you're going to get, don't hold it uh, perpendicular, so don't hold it like this, 
it want it to sit like it does in the cutter block so at its most extreme point of cut in the actual cutter block it will be sat at a slight angle like this um, it won't be sat perfectly flat like that so that's what we want to replicate when we're holding it against a piece of timber so we have to put that that angle on as well to check that the uh, profile is right and that does make quite a difference so if you ask for a perfect uh, radius cutter of say I don't know like a 15 mil radius that cutter is more likely to be maybe 16 mil from that point there to that point there to make up for the fact that it sits at a slight angle so we'll use that one to cut that base profile and uh, clean that last bit out with a, uh, a different cutter or perhaps the bottom of the cutter and again just uh, nick that little um, rebate out with perhaps the same cutter again so looks like we could probably do it all with this, uh, with this wooden cutter which would be nice right let's mount this bad boy into a block look away now if you're a safety freak because this isn't great practice I haven't got uh, exactly the right limiters to match these cutters. I bought them cheap at a woodworking show. I think there must have been a set of custom cutters made that uh, were either wrong or customer didn't pay for or didn't want. So uh, they sold them off. There's loads of them at the show um, being sold off. So I bought a couple of sets and this is one of them. And it was uh, just cutters, no limiters. So as long as the uh, when you line the holes up, it doesn't protrude past the bit that we're going to use. Um, you just got to take it really carefully. I'm not recommending you use cutters without uh, the proper limiters in the block, especially if you're not uh, not confident or uh, experienced on a spindle model. Just to nip up tight with them. Nothing too aggressive, especially on this little block here. This is the first block I bought but if you tighten it up too much it actually pinches the spindle and stops it going on the spindle. Rito, let's mount her up. So we'll take this other block out. Feeling like a bit of a pimp right now because we've got two cameras on the go. Push your test for this screw.
that was fairly painless because that cutter was actually very close to what we wanted so there we go that's uh, plenty good enough to replicate that moulding once it's been painted in along these edges and filled that round in like it's done on that piece um, you could scribe that into an existing piece pretty much uh, seamlessly there so just to finish that bit off we need to put the bevel on so we've got a bevel on the back here um, it's going to sit like this so we'll just take that measurement off of here, using the face. If you haven't got one of these already, I'll put a link in the description. These things are dead handy and they're not particularly expensive either. 69 I think that's coming out at. These trend angle measures are about 20 quid. But they're deadly accurate. I mean, they're as accurate as a engineer's square really for setting up a planer or a fence, something like that. Um, and you can do any angle throughout 360 degrees so really really handy bit of kit to have in the workshop um, and much better than a bevel for a job like this especially when you've got a spindle molder that will uh, read the angle measurement out as well so 69 degrees we'll transfer that over to the spindle or a rebate block So on this machine there's a uh, lock for the bevel on the spindle, so it's this lever down here. So we need to undo that and then the hand wheel on the front alters the angle of the spindle. So we're at 90 degrees, excuse all the white bits, it's just polish and polishing some bits of paintwork. So 90 degrees and we wanted 69 degree cut. So from 90 that's 21 degrees. So on here we want to add 21 degrees on. Wind this lever around until the bevel shows. 111 degrees. On all the Felder equipment, um, one revolution of the wheel is generally two millimetres or two degrees as shown on the gauge here. So for, for most of their kit that applies across the range, which is dead handy. Um, you know exactly how much you how many spins you're gonna do to raise the thickness of bed up or like this, you can use a gauge like this, and it gives a really accurate um, degree increment per revolution. So it's much better than having a gauge on the side of the machine where it uh, points at, at a degree angle on a on a metal rule. This is a much better way of doing it. So if we just roughly eye that against this bit of wood, just to double check that we're about right, we can see it's pretty much cock on. I'm just going to run them pieces through, making sure that the finish width is exactly what we want. When I thickness them down, I just left it uh, half a mil thicker than I wanted it to finish. So this is a 108 mil finish. The actual pieces that I've thickened are 108 and a half mil, and I'll just take that last half a mil off now with this cutter block. There we go, that's part one done. Let's move on to part two and the bigger moulding. Now this little bugger is gonna be a bit more interesting than the last one because I've not got an awful lot of cutters with a shallow, deep curve like this. So I might end up grinding something. I've got one cutter I'm not sure if it's going to do it yet, so um, we'll get to that stage when we get to it. So let's take some measurements of the actual outside sizes or dimensions of the uh, piece of wood. Uh, 
96 mil tall. I 70 deep. So a bit of X3 before. 96 for 70. And we're going to do uh, two at four meters if we've got it. I think they've said 3.6s, so we've, uh, we might get an extra little bit out for him. Plain knee bits of wood up. I've actually cut them off to length. I've rang the decorator and asked him what lengths of timber he's going to finally cut them to. So I'm not machining up a full four meter length of wood. I'm working with a two meter and uh, I think it's 1.6 meter lengths and it's a bit, bit easier to handle on over the planer on my own. And there's a slight bend in the uh, overall four meter length piece. So you've never got a flat plane section um, that held up to the uh, size that we need so we've cut it into smaller bits and uh, managed to get what we need so I'm just going to go through the cuts that I'm going to make on the spindle and uh, try and work out an order in which I'm going to do them so I've got this uh, cutter that I'd ground uh, for a previous job probably I'm just going to give it a bit of a touch up so it's uh, a bit sharper than it is um, so we get a bit cleaner cut but um, it's quite a good fit for this curve here I mean the curve does change in shape it's almost perfect for that section there so I'm just going to draw on the sections that we've uh, we've sort of managed to to cover so it's going to cut from there to there and it will cut this section here too nicely um, if we just draw the edges of the cutter on in a straight line, we know where we're going to come to. And it'll cut that section nicely from there to about there somewhere. So that just leaves a slip a little bit in the middle that we'll take off with a third cut. So um, we'll work out the cut order for that in a minute. Um, this little groove here, I think we'll make do with this uh, eight mil um, groove cutter. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, so we we'll take that, uh, that last little dib up there out with this uh, eight mil cutter, and that should hopefully have the depth to reach there, because that's quite a deep cut against a, a full square profile of timber. Um, this cut here is actually gonna be really nice and easy. I'm just going to tilt this uh, lamb's tongue cutter on the spindle and that should, uh, should take that out pretty much in a one so that's nice and easy and then it's just a rebate at the bottom so we've not actually got too many cuts this one can be done dead last we'll just uh, turn the spindle into reverse and cut it from the top so we'll use this back edge here as a, uh, as a guide edge along the bottom of the machine and that will be running above the piece of timber. So that one can be dead last, so we don't got to worry about that. Um, that cut in there, we'll need to see really, because we're going to need to run that from these faces. So really, it's got to have a, a fairly decent flat edge on this, this side or um, on the top edge for that to reference from to get an accurate cut. So um, if we do the bevel on the top here, dead last, and we've got a nice square edge there, we can run the piece of timber this way and have the, uh, the disc cut that out nice and accurately uh, near the end. So really it's down to the order of cutting these um, bevels without, uh, without risking the timber tipping into the fences. So I think I'm going to machine like this for a start and I will rebate out to the height of this little bead here. So, so to that, uh, that little uh, nib there, rebate out to, to pretty much that height through to there and take that out in one cut. So leave us with a nice wide flat section here. Then use my uh, cutter that's ground here 
take out this first cut section and do the second cut section perhaps with it raised up as much as it will go to cut what I need it to then do this uh, this the uh, eight mil bevel up here so let's mark this out so that's one that's number two in the uh, in the middle there then if we do that there's three there do that last so when we've got to that point we'll have a, a nice square nib here of timber so that'll still be a, a square profile we should be able to sit that on the spindle there with this square piece that's left here and take out this last section over here so we'll do that as cut four that will be like that there or like that probably be running that backwards for the look of that cutter which is going to be fun number four um, then we'll probably do this mould here it's number five then we've got rebate and bevel and it's not going to really matter which order we do them in so now we've got a plan of attack we can transfer this uh, fillet that I've cut off to the square piece of timber and make a start on actually cutting it out. This piece of wood isn't quite as big as the um, sections that I've uh, that I'm machining from, so I've just got to be careful with this cut that I do from the back edge here. So that's the only one that I've got to be really careful on is because this piece that I'm using as a pattern section isn't quite as thick. So when we're referencing off this edge, that cut is going to be different on this to the actual um, pieces of wood. But uh, for the sake of getting uh, another piece of a coir out to use as a pattern, I'm just using this, uh, this small bit of softwood. Let's just uh, roughly draw that on. We should be able to uh, use that as a rough guide um, to machine to. And then once we've pushed it through the machine, we can check it with the actual section of timber. Right, cut one is going to be a rebate, followed by this first section of the curved moulding here. Now we've done that curved section, cut two is going to be the little bit. Now we've done that curved section, cut two is going to be the little bit that's going to be left in the middle between the two bigger curved sections, so this section here. Now while we've got the timber with the nice square edges, we're just going to cut this uh, eight mil circle round here um, on the on the moulding next.
cut number four is this big section of curved moulding along the top here. Cut number five is the lamb's tongue type profile at the bottom of the piece of timber. Right, so there we have it. That's the finished article. It's pretty close to uh, what the original was. There's a tiny bit of work to be done on this uh, this little bead here. I might just see if I've got a uh, little round over that can take that out. Um, but it's not a big job for the decorator just to run a hand plane around that and uh, sand it in on site once it's been fitted. So um, with a big moulding like that, you quite often find you're gonna to have to sand a little bit in here and there and uh, um, just work the, the moulding so that it ties in. But as far as a match goes, that's uh, it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good match for the overall piece of timber. Just if I just put the two pieces into each other like that, old versus new, you can see there's not gonna be an awful lot of work to get a perfect splice with them two pieces of timber. Rito, so the last section is this uh, sill section for the bay windows. Um, not a very interesting section to machine up normally. It's just a bevel um, or two bevels and a step. But this one actually measures 64 mil in the, uh, the overall sight line. So from this point uh, here, the peak to the uh, this is going to be a square bottom sill so to the flat on the, the bottom of the sill to that point is a 64 mil now as we're making these out of a coir we've got four meter lengths um, i didn't want to go and buy a three inch thick piece of timber so 76 mil thick timber and rip it down because you're just going to waste a load of a coir and it's going to cost the air so we bought X two and a half inch timber, which turns for about 65 mil. I'm going to plane it up to see if I can get 65 mil. But uh, if we can't get it, our plan of action is to machine this slightly differently to normal. So instead of uh, having this as the square piece of timber in these three sides and machining the bevel on here and here, we'll actually have that face as the parallel of the timber. So if we use this square line here as the, um, as the guide line. So that, uh, that sill cut there will actually be parallel with the edge of the timber. So this second line here will be the outside of the timber and then the 
other line out here would be the um, other line. We need to achieve this thickness here. That's the front of the sill where you see it and all of this, this is all along the bottom so you don't see it and this is where it will butt up to the existing timber and repair. So from that point there you can only see this edge to there and that edge to there. So there are finished timber thickness points that we need to adhere to. So that gives us a bit of tolerance on the thickness of the timber. So we could go down from uh, needing 64mm thick timber to having it from this line here to this point here, which if we stick a ruler on it is just under 60mm. So we could potentially use a 60mm piece of timber to get this sill out that measures 64mm. So that's really going to help us in this situation if we can't make that timber hold up. The only thing that we'll see that's different in that scenario, if we draw this sill on or draw around it, we'll end up with a bevel there, the sill there, the sill there. So that's our uh, sill section there. So if we if we say you had a 62 mil piece of timber. We managed to finish it 62 mil. The only thing we would see different is the fact that there's our 62 mil line. Where that line intersects it, the actual uh, sill itself would have a, a small bit missing on this back edge. So, um, so if we follow this line along here to there, so that would be our sill section and it would follow that line there. So from roughly this point here, that section there would actually be missing from the sill, this section here. So as it sat down on the timber or the stone sill or whatever is underneath, it'd only be from there to there that would be touching and there'd be a gap at that point. So that's the only difference and that's where we're gaining that bit of extra, extra allowance in the timber if we machine it in this way. I'm just going to chuck it through the planer and see what we end up with. That's almost pointless filming the intro to that bit because I've actually managed to get uh, get pretty much my finished size out of um, out of the piece of timber at. Uh, I think two metres is my longest length. Managed to get just under 64 mil or under 64 mil finish. So there's no need to do that extra machining um, if the timber hadn't held up. But I'm going to leave this in the video as a uh, it might help someone out if they're running out of uh, timber thickness and doing a similar job.